Okay, we are rolling, so let's get on this horse and ride it. It's about bloody time! <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, welcome to the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Rish Outfield. That's absurd. You'll never convince me that there is one single source of all evil power. And Big Anklevich. Solomon Grundy say there is. Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Dunsty Audio Fiction Magazine. Yes, welcome. I am Rish Outfield, one of your hosts. And I'm Big Anklevich, the other host. The, this is a very special day for the Dunsteef in that, uh, for, for multiple reasons. First, this is the first episode uh, we've done uh, in the 21st century. No, this is, <laughs> this is the first episode we've done in the new home of the Dunsteef, your new study. Yeah, that's right. We've got this study kinda, kind of assembled. It's not 100% assembled, but it's like 75% at least. I mean... I've got half of my toys or more up onto the shelf. Now I just need to find some books to put around them so that it actually looks like it's a really a bookshelf and not just a toy shelf. But it's just a toy shelf, really. Because I don't read books. I don't even like books. I don't like stories at all. Well, you've come to the right place. <laughs> yes. <laughs> this is a really neat room to me. And this is the very first time I've been in this room. Also, Well, no, that's not true. No, we were here one time doing we a recorded... That Gets My Goat. Before we were owners of this house, before we were, you know, we just snuck in through a window and sat on the carpet when the room was completely empty and very, very echoey, if I recall, from the <laughs> recorded version of that show. And it's far less echoey because there are things in the room now, right? Yeah, it does make a big difference. It'll get better still because my wife has yet to put the curtains on the window. And once the curtains are on there, that'll help dampen the uh, echoes. Oh, cool. And, of, of course, it's also much less echoey because we've got the real mics out. And we're not just using the the uh, Zoom set on the ground in between us. For 99% of the shows, of the of the Dunsteef episodes that we did, we recorded them in your kitchen. At the kitchen table, in hardwood kitchen chairs that were uncomfortable. Sometimes holding the mic, sometimes having... The mic's held for us. By the lovely Dunsty Fats. Yes, all one of them. But this is so much more comfortable. I'm in a chair that actually, like, moves, mm -hmm. swivels. Tilts back and You're forth. You're in a chair, too. To I side. assume that it is comfortable. It's not. And the mics are sitting on a desk where the computer is, right in front of us. This is, is, wait, you tell me, is this everything that you imagined when you said we're going to pick out a, a house and maybe I can have a study there? Or is it getting there? What more needs to be in here? Uh, to tell you the truth, not a whole lot. Uh, this is really close to what I've always wanted. The one thing, these bookshelves go, I, I, I would say they're six and a half feet tall. I've always wanted the ones that go all the way to the ceiling. Which is still the plan. There are extensions that we can buy that can take these up the rest of the way. Two more shelves will go on to that. Are you tall enough to touch the ceiling while standing? No. The ceilings are actually pretty high in this place. I don't know how high they are, but I would say eight feet. Or... Nine? Well, they've got to be higher know. than that. Maybe nine? Because surely your I think I could probably eight reach feet. eight feet. Yeah, because I'm six feet tall, and so I would think my arms can reach another two feet. I'm not sure... You again, you you underestimate yourself. I'd say you're at least seven feet tall. Oh, okay. Um, anyhow, <laughs> th so that's one thing. This is the very first time we're doing a show in here. And the, uh, the second thing is this is the first show we've done. What was it that we did last? The pumpkin oh. one, um, where we just used my audio of my reading for Audible was the last episode we recorded for the Dunsteef. And that was right before you moved out of the old house. When, uh, when would that have been? Now, the calling came after that. We recorded that before We recorded then? the calling in May. Oh. 
and That's we recorded funny. the pumpkin one in June. <laughs> huh. I do remember us actually talking about that, saying this is the last time we're going to record here, although you may hear another one that was recorded earlier. So it has been a long time, so long that I didn't remember how to start. <laughs> I mean, it's it's I it, I almost feel like I've been saying the name of the show wrong or something. It's just yeah, it's I'm funny. Not, it'll take a little while, I guess, to get back into practice. Although we maybe we're already there because I'm flapping my jaw and I can see you looking at the clock. <laughs> <laughs> that is what happens when you start at one o'clock. The <clears throat> third thing that's special about this. Do you want to tell people what that is? Uh, yeah, it's funny because. <sighs> It's been uh, such a long time that we've hoped for something like this. It got to the point where we've assumed that it would never happen. And then the other day, out of the blue, we find out that the Dunstief won a Parsec Award. No, it didn't. The Dunstief won a Parsec Award. Oh, I uh, guess I'll just keep hoping. Okay, well, here's a, a let me interrupt with a tiny bit of trivia. This episode was scheduled... For April, the one that we're recording right now. And I wrote a terrible song for that episode, wherein you expressed, (laughs) I won't go as far as to say disdain, but I will say apathy towards a certain organization of podcasting awards. And I sing a song hoping to cheer you up. And at the end, it has no result, right? Uh Uh-huh. And that was our plan, is we were going to air this episode right now. <laughs> then, and, and this was a song, I think I wrote the song in February. That's how far behind we are right now. Then, Yeah, then this episode was going to, this story that was going to follow that. But it was all our explanation of why we were not participating in the Parsec Awards this year. And, and to make a long story short, instead, in, in case you didn't hear that wonderful song, and I, we're not going to redo the song, right? I, that was my plan, is I would change that rhyme at the beginning that I didn't like, and we'd actually do it with music, and we'd have like a cool, remastered, excellent version <laughs> where it's not off-key, <laughs> recorded in two different occasions in your garage. <laughs> um, but to make the explanation in one sentence, it was just too much work for what had historically been no reward. Right. Is that fair to Yeah, to yeah, that was kind of the deal. I, there's a I, there's a lot of work that goes into submitting your show for the Parsec Awards. People nominate shows and then you get an email that says, "Hey, your show's been nominated. You need to give us this perfectly timed thing." Has to can only be this long of an intro, this long of the story. Depending on what your category is, you can only have this long. You put a little break in here if you want to, but all you can do is do a, a straight up dissolve. You can't add, change anything. You can't add There's anything no to editing it for time. It was all. It was just so, and you're you're thinking, okay, how can I give them the best sample that gives them the best idea? Because they never ever ever give you enough. They never say, give us the sample, and for the sample, give us the entire story. You know, it's always like, okay, let's see. This is the novella length, so let's think. What is a chunk of time that's too small to give you a decent sample of a novella? Well, let's say 45 minutes. Oh, this is the short. Okay, well, then you only get 15 minutes. You know, they just make it whatever it is that's too small to give you anything worthwhile. I don't know. It got really frustrating. And year after year, we'd have a nomination. We never told anybody this, and I had forgotten until you reminded me. We actually recorded acceptance videos (laughs) for the very first time we were nominated for the Parsecs. And you told me, I mean, we went elaborate where we had a theme and we had jokes and all that stuff. And we recorded different versions. (laughs) I had forgotten about that, but that's how into it we were the first time we got it. And then we didn't win. And how many times have has this Parsec thing been going on? Is this the fourth year? Uh, I think this may be just the third, but it could be the fourth too. I can't remember. Yeah, you it, told it got me t- early on, I'm not going to participate in it this year because, I mean, with each passing year, you get more busy anyway. With each passing child, you get more busy and fatter. And uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you. <laughs> And and you said I just I can't. It's it's too much work. I, I I can use that time making the show or writing my own stories or making another child. 
right? Yeah, yeah. No, that's totally what I did. And I stuck to that. That's the funny thing is I did not. I think what really happened is I got an email where they said, hey, we've extended the deadline for Parsec submissions and you can, you have another week or something like that. And that was the first time I'd even thought about the Parsecs and the fact that we've been nominated, you know, since like February and it was like June 15th. I don't know. It was way near the end. And I thought, I guess I'll send these on to the people who produced the episodes and they can throw together a sample and submit it if they want. So I sent it on and Renee and Brian Lincoln were the ones that actually made up the samples and sent them into the Parsec Awards. Um, so I guess that's what it was, is we just needed to get me out of the equation and boom, instant winning sample. <laughs> okay, well, remind me, what did we win for? We won for the Rick Kennett story that we ran, let's see, two episodes ago in... <laughs> it was episode 139, The Road to Utopia Plane by Rick Kennett, which we ran in January. And, and that was produced by Renee Chambliss. That was produced by Renee Chambliss. And she uh, and we were also nominated for... Harlan's Wake, I believe. Episode 135, which was Harlan's Wake by John Miro. Rhymes with? Rhymes with hero, not with zero. That one was produced by Brian Lincoln, and he put together the sample for that one and sent it in. And we did that one back in October. And uh, yeah, so those were our two nominations, which I assumed was doom for us because we've had two nominations in the same category before. And I just figured, you know, that's a bad idea. I think last year I made sure we didn't try to get one in the same category, even though we could have. I think there was a few nominations where I just said, I'm not sending in a submission for that because if we do that, then we'll have two competing against each other. And if somebody says, hey, I want the Dune Steve to win, and they vote for one, and then the others, I want it, and they vote for the other, and then... They cancel each other. Yeah, we screw ourselves. <laughs> it's like when uh, Ross Perot ran for president. That's right. <laughs> I figured we didn't have a chance. I didn't worry too much about it. It was nice to be nominated. I could put up the little thing that says we were a nominee again. And, you know, I've been content with that all these years should we finish talking about this after the story we've been going on for a long time and we haven't even got to the story yet well i know but this is still pre-story we business. don't it's important do episodes very often <laughs> so when we do if they're 90 minutes long people will appreciate that we forgot how it goes how you go about it we're supposed to be in the story by now and talking about all this stuff after yeah <laughs> Okay, it's so, been so long since we've done an episode of The Den, Steve, that we just... All right, so what were we saying? Just oh, So how did you find out about this? Uh, somebody sent an email to, to our uh, email address, said, congratulations. I don't remember who it was, but they said, yeah, congratulations on the Parsec. Dunlop. Yeah, I think you're right. And I saw that and I went, what? I better go find out what the heck. This is going to sound super douchey, so of course I'm not going to cut it out. I checked after we got this email i hadn't read the email i just saw the subject line and so i checked and i saw that star trek outpost had won a parsec award and i was like oh this is just about star trek outpost <laughs> so i never read the email until later nice yeah we need to figure out that's that's the one thing that i still haven't got up on my bookshelf is my parsec award i need to figure out how do i get myself a statuette do they call them statuettes for the parsecs, or is that just a big-time award kind of a thing? I think they call them statuettes, yeah. Good. Whoa. Because I want a statuette. I need to figure out how I get myself one of those. You you said that the Star Trek Outpost people send out an email saying you can get one as long as you're willing to pay the money to get one, huh? Apparently. Apparently, for, for something like Outpost, where there's a hundred people involved, they will make to order as many statuettes as, as people want. Well, then that means anyone who has a voice on that show oh. can have one. Okay, well, yeah, that's fair. We're not going to pay for anybody except Oh, yeah, maybe. we're not paying for them. they got to pay except the $25 maybe. themselves. <laughs> uh, okay, so I, I, one more time. Even though uh, you didn't want to do it, and I just laid there, thank you to everybody who voted for us, and thank you to Renee, without whom we wouldn't have... Well, we would have still had Brian's nomination, but we certainly wouldn't have had <laughs> this win. And uh, thank you to uh, Rick Kennett, who 
you know, despite our terrible Australian accents, continues to send us stories. Yeah, he actually won two parsecs on the day. For he, two different Side to Gertz stories. two different Side to Gertz stories. Yeah, Side to Gertz is gold. Next time, we're going to uh, put in our, our Side to Gertz story every year, and we'll, we'll just keep taking it home. That might work. Hey, we've got we've got one in the submissions that we need to read and get back to him on. So there you go. We've had it there for like two years, so maybe we ought to get to it. Oh, that's sad. <laughs> Speaking of two years, that's we how long have it a took story. to get to the story today. It, it, it is. <laughs> that's how long it took since we've started recording to get to the story. <laughs> oh, that's just barely an exaggeration. But we do have a story today. And yes, it sat for a long time. I mean, the, the story has sat finished for a long time on your computer, but also it's been, it's got to have been something we got in 2011, right? The Probably. It, the funny thing is, I think the last story from this author was also nominated for a Parsec, if I remember right. The author of today's story is Ray Cluley, who if you can think back that far... He was the man who wrote the story called Beachcombing. Beachcombing or Beachcomber? Beachcomber, Beachcomber, Little Bo Peep. <laughs> this time around, his story is called Tethered to the Cold and Dying. Sounds like a nice, uplifting, fun story, huh? You guys are in for a treat? A nice, rollicking, happy-go-lucky thing? Know what I mean? Know what I mean? <laughs> hey? Uh, but yeah, Ray Cluley has appeared on the show before with Beachcombing. Um, his fiction has been published in Black Static, Inner Zone, Shadows and Tall Trees, and The Best Horror of the Year, Volume 3, amongst other places. This story, Tethered to the Cold and Dying, first appeared in issue 233 of Interzone from TTA Press. You can find out more about Ray's work at his blog, where the link is in the show notes. Oh, you seem to remember how to do this. On with the story. Tethered to the Cold and Dying by Ray Cluley. <sighs> 2 9 is hilly terrain to cross on foot. It's tiring work and treacherous in the dark, but I have to keep going to charge the Kinjin. Without it, if the batteries die, I die with them, even in full out gear. As it is, I've got regulated temperature, zero grade rads, and an avcom that crackles too often, but it's otherwise fine. I can't afford to be without any of it. The first three SIGs had taken a little under four hours, but the snow is slow going especially uphill. And the bulk of the outgear makes my movements awkward. The next sig looks to be another hour or so, depending how often I fall. I've fallen plenty already, of course. I always do in this clumsy fucking thing, but no fall has been serious enough to damage the pute or change my mind. I ignore her. She wants me to tell her how hard it is. Tell her she was right. There's nothing out here. It isn't worth it. Jackson, answer me. She actually sounds worried. Even over the crackle of static. I'm all right, Mother. Just... Tired. Not so far, but it's only been three signals. He said 16. He also said he was from 212, didn't he? But that was bull. Her intonation adds an unspoken two. There's a moment of blissful quiet after, and I'm not ready to spoil it by agreeing. Just because he'd lied about where he'd come from didn't mean he'd lied about everything else. I pat the chest pocket where I've stored the pill foils, intending to reassure myself they're still there. 
but I can't feel a thing through the thick rubber layer keeping me alive. You got enough sin? Yeah. Of course I do. When you get back here, I'll cook one of the slabs. I smile. She means it as an incentive to abort, and as a damn effective temptation. My mouth floods with saliva at the thought of hot meat. We eat it rarely, of course, and we have to ration it even more now. But we've eaten recently enough that I can remember the taste and texture. Yeah, that sounds good, Mother. That sounds good, Mother. I'm going to close the link a minute. This bit's steep. And I don't want to hear you remind me of the folly of giving away our meat slabs. She doesn't need to, though. It's buried in there with the offer. Again, I pat where the foils are. Again, I can't feel anything. It will be there, I say into the suit. It fogs and is, and there's a hiss as the outgear adjusts to compensate. It sounds like Mother's sigh. A man called Connor had wandered into what was left of 2-9 when I was watching the screens. Had it been Mother on cams, I'd never have known about him. She'd grown distrustful of other people since Alf Alpha. I couldn't blame her for that. The comedian who'd named the farm station was not much fun when the crops failed. In the resulting chaos of his more ill-tempered leadership, those who had been friends became otherwise. A few of us left when the people we thought we knew began to show a selfish side, a natural enough development without the promised harvest. And the few of us became two of us by the time we got to what I've come to call home. Just mother and me. Until Connor. Identify. The man I saw on cam stopped moving. There was a moment I could hear his panting when he opened the link. He panted some more and looked around at the hills, looking for the eyes I was watching with. What happened? Something must have. Nobody wandered around in outgear for a stroll. Give me a sick pulse. I'll come and tell you. I hesitated, hand wavering between calm and homesick. I didn't even consider telling Mother. When I pressed the home signal booster, it was entirely my own decision. Receiving LAC. You're about one and a half sigs away. I'll put the kettle on. It surprised some laughter out of him. (laughs) Milk and two sugars. (laughs) Loud and clear. I crest yet another hill to find that this time, there's only a downward slope. A sig flashes recognition of my tech, and a pulse adjusts my nav. I don't need it. I can see where I'm heading easily enough. The sector star line is intact, just as he'd said. It rises from somewhere distant, straight up into somewhere more distant still, right there in front of me. Just a gray pencil line in a gray sky, quickly swallowed by permacloud, but it stands out stark against the snow of the horizon, even in the dark of day. As I stare, grinning for no one to see, an L-flow flashes its way up. It traces the star line at a speed designed for human visual, and I watch it ascend. It beckons me. Follow me up. Up, it says turning the cloud mass green for a moment before disappearing altogether. I tap a message to Mother, wishing we were still in calm range, hoping my told you so is clear enough in numbers. She numbers back, asking about electric light flow. If she's happy, it doesn't show in code. I tap back a yes. By then it is fired again, racing into space and calling me up, up, as it had before. 
There's still power, which means the elevator should work. All I have to do is get there. I'm careful to go slow. Clumsy out gear or not, what I want to do is run. There's nothing else from Mother. She knows what I'll do. Upon his arrival, I took Connor a flask packet, but I took it in a mug. When the door to the outroom slid up, he was stepping free of his gear. It was only a partial suit and badly worn in places, thin about the knees and on the palms. I was dismayed at something else I saw, too, or rather, at something I didn't see. The man was traveling with the poorest type of rad guard. He only wore lead film. He saw me and smiled saw the mug, and his eyes went wide. For a moment, I think he actually thought it was a hot, steaming cup of tea. I relished the joy of his expression, but felt bad for it as well. It had meant to be a light-hearted icebreaker. Now I felt like I'd offered a child candy, only to tell them no. Sorry, just packet stuff. I upended the cup and caught the foil. Still, the best offer I've had in two days. He smiled. Hello. He offered his hand, still gloved, and we shook. The pute had said no for rads. Wouldn't be long, though, if he was set on traveling much further, dressed like he was. His suit was so thin, I could feel the calluses of his hand through the rubber. Jackson. Connor. I gave him the drink. Just you, Connor? Just me. He took the foil, snapped it hard against his knee, then tore a corner. I was amused to see him tip the contents into the mug instead of sucking straight from the packet. It would go cold real quick that way, but worth the laugh we shared. (laughs) (laughs) What about you? Anyone else at this home post? He was stripping the belt from his shoulders and shrugging out of the mantle. When he stopped... I assumed it was for my answer. Me and Mother. You'll meet her just as soon as I have told her about you. Connor indicated behind me with his cup. Consider me told, said Mother. She'd come straight from the lab, from the looks of her splash mac, wiping her hand with a cleanser instead of offering it. It wasn't the warmest welcome. She eyed the newcomer, then me, then left. She must have known we were watching her because she slammed her fist against one of the corridor panels and a door hissed down behind her. It was a dramatic exit. Connor ignored her rudeness and ducked out from the last of his gear, dropping it at his feet. Not a people person? I shrugged. Not anymore. You take more after your dad, I suppose? (laughs) I laughed again. Three times in one day. That was one for the log. But she's not my mother. I just call her that because she acts like one. An in-law, most of the time. It had started as a joke, the mother thing, back in Alpha Alpha. But it had stuck, and neither of us seemed willing to change it. There was probably something psychological there, even with her being so much younger than me. But I wasn't willing to explore that. Unless Connor was a head tech... I wouldn't have to. Anyway, I had questions of my own. What happened at 212? He didn't answer straight away. The sign uses a capital S, from back when Starline was a company, and not a word all of its own. There's a simple logo, too. A large circle with a vertical line connecting it to a smaller circle above. When I get closer, I see the slogan, The sky is the limit no longer. It seems pathetically prophetic now. Sadly pessimistic without meaning to be. Going up to go forward. I manage, singing the jingle with one breath. Surprising myself by remembering the tune. The outgear hisses disapproval as it compensates for the exhalation. Starline had been the first company. They made a lot of money, not that it mattered in the end, and invited other countries to get involved, 
invited all sorts of companies to invest. They even invited the public to travel. The compound beyond the sign, however, does not look inviting. Fences are only posts and wires, which is probably why they're still standing. And a gatehouse boasts two automated sentries. The lenses are frosted over, making for a dozen or so blind eyes in each suspended orb. Neither sentry rotates as I approach. Neither tracks my movement. The audio valve dangles from one. Both have been stripped of their guns, the support scaffold drooping impotently. Beyond them, several large mounds in the ash tell of where trucks are parked. And beyond these is a single building. They called it the Roundhouse, according to another Starline sign. From the middle of this emerges the cable. Except it's no more a cable than the snow around me is really snow. It's just the word we use. I'm so close I have to lean back to look up. Another elf flow fires. A line of light traveling up, up, up. The rain flashes its way into cloud and beyond more to illuminate what it is than to indicate its operational power. It's an elevator shaft with a very long way between floors. Two twelve is cursed, Connor told us. We were celebrating his arrival with slabs. They didn't look much, but meat was meat, processed or not. Mostly, Mother and I stuck with the synths, but this occasion warranted something a little more grand. I tore my block into irregular chunks, making it seem more like the real thing, and was amused to see Connor do the same. Mother cut angles from hers, and ate without any outward sign of pleasure, though we could all hear each other's belly rumbles of gratitude. What happened? Mother asked. Connor spoke with his mouth full. Mm. Mm. Or is this beef? His groans of delight were comical. Mostly, I said, grinning around my own forkful. And not the best bits of the cow. I don't care. He shoveled in another piece. What happened? Mother asked again. He looked at her. Lots of things, he said. Synth mold, power failure, uh, a couple of cases of cabin fever... Uh, The usual stuff you don't want to happen. Only we got a lot of it all at once. A leak, too. Old reactors. Uh, They sealed off the worst of it pretty quick. Remembering his rat guard. I hoped so. What else? Connor ignored her while he devoured the last of his meal. It only took a few moments. His answer, though, was merely to repeat her question. What else? Yes. She explained. What else? Something made you leave. It was getting scary. Political. Uh, you seen politics work on a small scale? I got out before I had to take a side and hurt someone on the other one. Mother simply grunted. We had our own politics. But since Alpha Alpha, the worst that ever happened between Mother and me was a few days of silent treatment. Settling back into his chair... Connor tried to strike up a friendly conversation with Mother. Uh, what did you do before? Before what? She pushed a final chunk of slab around, wiping up juice. They both understood at the same time, and were embarrassed. Connor because he'd realized Mother wasn't that old, and Mother because she'd forgotten she looked like she was. Who's running 212? She asked, recovering quickly, if not gracefully. Her tone was aggressive. Look, I didn't mean... I was born mid-winter, just like you. He accepted that with a nod. Well, what are your skills? I said to fill the new silence. Tech? Production? Medical? Me! I'm a tech mech, but... Connor waved it away and sucked at his drink foil. I'm not staying... There are footprints, heading to the docking platform. Nothing more than slight indentations, but sheltered by the building, they still haven't filled completely, 
and the lights of my outgear pick them out easily. It's proof I no longer need that Connor found this place, though it seems his visit was more recent than he let on. This close, the elf flow flash is dazzling. I follow it up, leaning back to watch. I won't see the next. By the time the next pulse fires, I'll be chambered in and going up ahead of it. I pat the pills again. I wonder what the planet will look like from above. Will I see anything through the cloud? How, how much is left? Will I see? There's movement. In an accompanying whir as one of the platform cams tracks my approach. I stop. I know it's automated, recording my slow steps for no one to ever see. But I can't help but wave. Hello up there! The outgear hates me for it, telling me it's pissed with each word. But I don't care. I'd sing if I had the energy. One of the docking doors has been smashed, so there's no need to open them. I step through the remaining frame into a large landing station. All aboard! The climber is bigger than I imagined. And I realize... The truck-shaped mounds out in the snow might not be trucks after all. I remember the adverts, showing sleek tubes and bright colors. These are more like freight containers, but a little more rounded at the edges. For some reason, I thought there'd be windows. Silly. The laser mount looks intact. But then, I'm only a grade 3 mech. I don't really know what I'm looking at. It'll either send me up or not. Hopefully it won't burn a hole through me or boil my insides. The terminal switch is on all right. Fast, actually. I set the deployment speed to Connor's instructions. It's nothing but a long line of numbers, but important, apparently. It takes a while to process. The scrolling weight bar aptly vertical. I go to the climber. The door opens on my approach, sliding without sound. It bumps quietly closed behind me. Proceed, prompts a touch screen inside. I touch the yes panel, fingers fat in my gloves, and there's a series of horn blasts I'm unprepared for. They startle me. The screen shows a radiation symbol, and a bar beneath scrolls down to empty. I'm given the all clear. It takes almost ten minutes to build the courage to remove the outgear. The chamber may seem sealed and reassuringly bright inside, but I still remember the smashed door outside. And I've never been anywhere beyond 2-9 without full kit, however briefly. But then, why come all this way to get scared now? I pull the neck brace pipes, remove the helmet... The first breath I take is achingly fresh, though I know it's as processed as anything else I've had in my lungs these last few years. I close my eyes with the inhalation, dropping the helmet to the floor without ceremony, relishing its absence. Proceed, the panel prompts again. This time, I pull off my gloves and feel the coolness of the screen when I press yes. Next, I feel for the pills. Still there. I wait for the hum of machinery before taking them. Going up. Enter these numbers. You'll get some lean, but this minimizes it. I looked at the paper. It was crumpled to a faded mass of creases held together only by the ink on them. The numbers were legible, though. Lean? Coriolis effect, he said as if it explained everything. I never thought to ask how he knew all about it. Mother would have. I don't need anything else? No coordinates or anything? <laughs> no, there's only up. 35,000 kilometers or so of it. Are you scared of heights? <laughs> I left. Can't blame you for leaving. Hey, look, Mother can be cold, but... Connor held up his hand and shook his head friendly. I understand, really. She has Malona's. Shit. 
Yeah. We gave that the moment it deserved. You'll need to look for something called climatize, Connor said eventually. They're pills for the journey. Don't ask me what they do. I just know you'll need them. They look like this. He showed me a handful of pills. They were pale as beans and almost the same size. I wouldn't be dry swallowing them. No pills, no trip? No pills, no trip. He waited for me to ask, so I think it was my idea. Can I just trade you something for those ones? You said you weren't going up anyway. He probably smiled then, though it may have been a sad one, I suppose. He was careful to have his back to me. How much of that meat you got? When I was a boy, before the winter, my dad took me out fishing. Only once. We went out onto the lake and I hooked a big one, but I couldn't kill it. I got it from the water, netted it, had it in the boat. But after watching it flop around, drowning in the air, I let it go. I'd had so much encouragement from dad reeling it in that I felt like I'd disappointed him, though he said otherwise. So I insisted we stay out till I caught it again. We stayed out even when the wind came in, rocking the boat and making the water choppy. I was sick. Very sick. He didn't take me out again. My trip up the star line is like that. It's not the climber, or the lean Connor told me about. It's the pills. I feel queasy. Seasick. The only difference is I'm not throwing up. I'd feel worse without them, apparently. I sit slumped in the corner, out gear still on save for the helmet and gloves. I breathe processed oxy, and it tastes fresher than suit air, but still I feel nauseous. After the initial launch, it doesn't feel like I'm moving at all. I could be sitting in the docking station still, for all I know. Across from me is the pute, its console a scrolling line of numbers, as if compensating for the upward motion I can't feel. I wonder if I can use it to signal Mother, tell her where I am, but my limbs are heavy and my movement's sluggish. I feel pressed into the corner I sit in. I don't think this unit was designed for passengers. There are holding panels for cargo, and only one chair. When the screen blinks and the numbers are replaced by a curious face, I wonder if I've fallen asleep. It's only there for a moment. Maybe the pills are making me hallucinate. Then the face is gone the numbers are slowing down. He's taken our synth. We can make more. I was already working on it. What about slabs? Can we make more of those? That was supposed to surprise me. Shock me. I gave them to him. You gave them to him? Why? If he wants to traipse around out there, that's his choice. But he can do it with synth. Why give him our meat? She was furious. It was a trade. For those. I pointed to the climatize. Up until then, she had been holding herself in the doorway, literally clutching the frame as if coming all the way into the lab would lead to something she still had sense enough to avoid. But at the sight of those pathetic pills... Three tablets in exchange for actual food. She came striding in. She scooped them up with barely a glance, only to throw them at me with a yell. I ducked, more from the sudden violence of the act than from any fear of being struck. You gave him all of this year's meat for those? No, I said, ashamed of the whine in my voice. I gave him four slabs. She rubbed her hands over her face and took a series of deep breaths to calm herself. Four? She said. It was more to herself. Four? She looked at me, the anger gone. But what I saw instead was worse. He took it all, everything that wasn't in freeze. I couldn't believe it. I left the scope I was at and ran to the kitchen, 
only to find she was right. At least he didn't know about the outgear, she said softly from behind me. At least you were sensible enough about that. I knew from her tone she didn't simply trust that to be the case. She'd checked. I'll get on the console. No point. He won't answer. He sure won't come back. I nodded, already knowing what I was going to do. First, I had to find the pills. There's a hiss from somewhere. A system's noise that fills the chamber. And the room I'm in shudders. It pumps up and down. There's another hiss. And then nothing. The numbers on the monitor have stopped and the cursor blinks under the last three entries of a much diminished line of data. I'm getting up to read the screen when the doors hush open. I lurch from my helmet and pull it on, breathing frantically before the outgear can even dispense any air. Then the gloves, jamming two fingers into one opening in my haste. The rush of oxy cools my sweating face, and I'm breathing pipe-pumped air again. I go to the open doors, hesitantly, keeping a lot of floor space between me and the opening. A tiny room waits beyond, painfully bright in its fluorescent light and polished white cleanliness. There's glare on the screen of my mask, so I raise a hand to block it. There's nothing to see but another door. The monitor inside the capsule shows a countdown from 3,000 to 2,000 to 1,000, but I've no idea what the measurements are. Under that, GSO, okay? I press the OK key, and everything blinks away to nothing. Even the lights power down. There's plenty coming from the room outside, though. Well, I didn't come all this way for nothing. I take bold strides to the door, but the bravado is undone when there's a gush of gas from various vents and I jump. Long plumes of cam envelop me, and I fan my hand around to funnel a clear area, creating a whirling tunnel between me and the door. A light I hadn't seen blinks to green, and the door opens. I can't see anything but darkness out there, but it's where I go. Hello? My voice carries no further than my mask, of course. Tendrils of the chem fog follow me out into a large storage area and disperse. Somewhere above me, a light flickers, flickers, and is on. Then another, another. The room is so large, I'm giddy. I put a hand on the doorframe to steady myself. Just a room, but it's been years since I've seen anything so vast. When I was young, I worked in a warehouse loading bay. A dozen of them would fit into what I was seeing, which also looked to be a loading bay of sorts. The ceiling was far above me. Light bulbs would need to be changed by forklift or body loader. They were so distant. I've lived in a warren of corridors and labs for almost all my years since winter, and in all of them I could touch the roof above me. I find myself wondering about birds, of all things. I stagger back, in panicked retreat from what I see, thinking, it has to be the pills. If it's not the climatize, then coming towards me from behind a pallet of plaque-wrapped boxes is a waddling group of geese. A gaggle, I realize. A gaggle of geese. And I wonder if I'm still sane. There's, There's about a dozen of them leaning left, right, left in a hurrying wobble to get to me. Their webbed feet are as orange as my outgear, their bodies a sleek feathered white, plump and heavy, beaks open only to honk their greetings, yet I'm afraid, or or rather I'm shocked, surprised, and I stumble away. A door panel glows its outline on the wall that steadies me, and I slap my palm against it, not caring where it leads, just wanting to get away. The door rushes up and open, and I step back over the threshold, my eyes on the approaching birds. Some have strayed away from the main group, but enough remain in pursuit that I call the door back down quickly, and then they're gone. My 
ridiculous <sighs> sigh of relief comes out of me ragged. My outgear bleeps urgently in time with my speeding heart rate. It slows as I back away from the door, and I turn to see where I am. I take such a breath that I feel lightheaded with all the oxy. Oh, is all I can manage. I exhale with a whoosh, and it clouds the viz, but not so much that I can't see. Maybe it's not the oxy making me lightheaded. Maybe it's the view. I step up to the window and press my hands to it. I am in awe. There are so many. So many of them. I'd forgotten. Stars. And just like that, I'm weeping. You can't go out there. It was a pointless thing for her to say. I was in the hatch, out gear on, ready. I'd calmed her down, only to say goodbye. All I had to do was flip a switch, and the outside would come inside. There was nothing she could do to stop that. She came into the hatch with me. What are you doing? I cried, snatching my hand back from the console as if burned. I'd been centimeters away from flooding her with rads. All right. There was something she could do to stop me. Temporarily. She knew I wouldn't open the doors with her unsuited in the hatch. He's lying. I checked 212. Comms don't reach that far. I checked the manifest. Half the people he mentioned aren't on it. What about the other half? There's nothing out there. I need to see. Why? You never did before? I couldn't explain. I couldn't put into words how our visitor had given me. More than just pills. She was born midwinter. She didn't know what hope was. Please. She tried. And that nearly worked. Not so much the rarity of the word from her, but the wetness of her eyes and the catch in her voice as she said it. I took off my helmet so it wouldn't be muffled this time. I need to see. I need to see. We stood facing each other, waiting for someone to relent. I have Malona's. It was cruel of her. I know. Maybe there's a better lab. One with the compounds you need. She shook her head. And for the first time, I saw her cry. Nothing as dramatic as sobbing. That would be too much of a weakness for Mother. No, quiet tears were the only ones that would ever wet her cheeks. I stepped nearer, arms open to embrace her, hold her close. But she hurried away and closed the door behind her. Go. She was on the console, speaking into my outgear. I heard her voice tinny and distant from the helmet in my hands. I put it on, and immediately the hatch opened. Mother was watching. I'm coming back, I said. I don't want you to. I walked out into the snow, wondering if either statement was true. It's a long time before I can take myself away from the window. Outside, the darkness of a sky I've not seen in years dazzles me with points of light I thought would only ever twinkle again in nursery rhymes. I have to remind myself that they're only suns, and I marvel that ours has been sending its own light out, yet can't penetrate the ash clouds of our new sky. I'm in a corridor that stretches a long way in front and behind, and several doors line its walls. Nearby, though, is a touch map, and I go to it eagerly, curious as to what I might find. I want to check for food, lab tech, medical supplies. Food is in a kitchen five doors down. The inventory reads like something from fiction. There's food here actual real food even though I'd seen the geese and even though it's partly what I've come for 
It's a surprise. A feast scrolls down before my eyes, and I salivate just reading it. I make for the kitchen at something close to a run, pulling off my helmet at the assurance of the screen that there's nothing to fear up here. The door opens into a white space of cupboards and drawers and fridges. There's an aroma of roast goose and half a carcass steams on the table, surrounded by bowls of cooked vegetables. Vegetables! There's a man here, eating. He's so close I hear the crisp of skin as he bites into a drumstick, wonderfully golden and real. Hi. He says, chewing with a nonchalance I find unbearable. Want some? There's too much to say, and too much food to eat instead. So I sit and gorge myself with complete abandon. The man's name is Hugo, and he wants my bone marrow. He tells me this before anything else. My my bone marrow? He's finished eating, but I'm still picking at platefuls of fruit. There are apples, golden delicious, and chunks of pineapple that glisten like uncut gemstones. You'll be sick, he says. I know. There's juice on my chin. I don't care. I sink my teeth into a shining curve of melon. My smile feels the same size. I have a degenerative bone disease, a cancer of the hematologic progenitor cells, a leukemia. If we're compatible, I can take stem cells from you and infuse them so they'll produce healthy cells in me once I've killed off my diseased ones. How? Radiation therapy. His answer is not without irony. Up here, radiation's part of his cure. (laughs) I mean... How will you transplant the bone marrow? It's easy. You won't even need stitches. A minimally invasive procedure. A guy with grade one med showed me how. I think of mother and lose my appetite. Eat up. You need it. I know how gaunt I look. I grew my beard only because I hated seeing a skeleton look back at me in mirrors. Synth may have all the nutrients but it doesn't do much else. Hugo, on the other hand, is a giant of a man, large in a way that speaks of too much food and too little exercise. Is it just you up here? I take another leg of meat. Just me. He rests his hands on a belly I envy. What happened to everyone else? Took the shuttle. Went to one of the other towers, most likely. This one's pretty bare. Thinking of all the food I'd seen listed in the inventory, I have to disagree. But then, he hasn't been on the surface since winter came. When the sky was filling with ash, he was up here stuffing his face and looking at the stars. Why why didn't you go with them? He shrugs. I waited for my doctor to come. And? Yeah, he came. So where is he now? Hugo stands towering over me, and takes my plate. He's gone, he says, clearing the table. The single bunk is no different to the one back in 2-9, but the amount of space around it makes it more comfortable somehow. That and the plate of cold cuts on the bedside table. And yet, I cannot sleep. Partly it's the window opposite that shows me stars, 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 but mostly it's thinking of Mother, Laura. I wonder if she's sucking a tube of synth for her evening meal, or maybe treating herself to one of the rationed slabs in my absence. Most likely, she's bent over one of the scopes in the lab, splash mac on, trying to create a new treatment for Malona's. In a fully equipped lab, it would be no problem. In 2-9... I sigh, swing my legs out of bed, and put my bare feet down to a cool floor. There's a light smock hanging on the door, so I put it on. It fits like an old hospital gown. In the days before winter, I would walk if I couldn't sleep. I used to do the same in 2-9, 
treading myself tired on the machine. But here I can do it the old-fashioned way. The quiet is something I'm very used to. The distance I can walk in a straight line is not. It's pleasant. I could go for a decent jog if I wanted. A whole bunch of people could. I find myself heading to the comms room. Broken, Hugo had said. Technological fault beyond repair that occurred shortly after his doctor arrived. Well, it couldn't hurt to look. Broken is right, but technological fault is euphemistic. The entire console has been attacked. Panels have been bent out of shape. Screens are cracked jagged. Dials and switches knocked from sockets. A heavy wrench lays nearby, but it hasn't been used for repairs. With the comms console spewing cables like bloodless innards from open wounds, it looks more like a discarded murder weapon. I pick it up. I head back to my room with the wrench in hand. Had one of the others sabotaged his communications, Hugo would have had no reason not to tell me. He must have destroyed it himself, cutting off any means of contact with the outside world. I find myself thinking about the other people, the ones that took the shuttle. Hugo is standing outside my door. The whispered hush of the one I open startles him, and he draws back. But I can tell he was reaching for the operating panel rather than the intercom. He was going to let himself in. Uh, What do you want? I'm careful to have the wrench behind my back, casual, the length of it hidden behind my leg. There you are. Where have you been? Hugo smiles, but he's more concerned than he wants me to think. For a walk, I couldn't sleep. Me neither. I thought I'd come and see if I could take a sample for tomorrow. He holds the syringe out for me to see, though I'd already noticed it cupped in his hand. We stare at each other for a moment. What exactly is wrong with you? It's a deliberately open question. A cancer of the hematologic progenitor cells. I've already said this, haven't I? If we're compatible... Again, he shows the syringe. Then I can take stem cells. I don't think so. He frowns. Not yet, anyway, I add. I'm hoping for a reassuring tone, but can't tell if I'm managing it. There's someone back where I came from. She's medically trained. I can get her and she can help. No. It's not far. I'll be back real quick. No, there are too many dangers. The radiation could damage your cells, or you may decide not to return. I will come back. I will help you. We'll do this, but we'll do it with her. Hugo steps forward. There are drugs that stimulate the release of stem cells from bone marrow into your circulating blood. He tries, raising the syringe. This time, not only to show me. I just need to insert an IV. I'm backing away, very aware again of how big this man is, how well fed, how much larger he is than me. I've seen the comms room. He stops. I don't trust you. Not now. Not enough for you to stick needles in me. Not enough to let you give me drugs. You've taken them already. The pills you took. I hadn't told him about. My brother gave them to you. Connor. Nobody finds this place without his help. He takes full advantage of my confusion and attacks. (coughs) He's bigger, but I'm quicker. His lunge is a desperate one. I'm able to sidestep easily. I bring the wrench around and up, but I can't bring it down on him. He turns and sees the threat, lunges at me again. This time he catches me across the front section, propelling me back against the wall. It knocks the wind from me, and it knocks the wrench from my hands. It clatters somewhere on the floor. I bring my bony elbows down on his back, but all I get from that is a grunt. I'm not even sure it's his. Then there's a sharp sting in my hip, and I realize he stuck me with a syringe. I twist in a panic, thrashing in his grip. I catch him in the cheek with my elbow this time and feel something crack there. He howls in pain, and I struggle free. My foot connects with the wrench before I can stoop to pick it up, and it spins away down the corridor. Fumbling for it, I see the syringe. He's dropped it in the struggle. 
I have time only to scoop it up, noticing the needle is broken, and then he's barreling into me again. The momentum forces me a few hurried steps back, and my legs tangle. I fall, bringing him down on top of me. His hands are on my throat. You're just like all the others. But I'll have it. Alive or dead, I'll have it. I can barely breathe. I bring the needle down to the back of his neck, forcing the plunger down with the blow, hoping to surprise him enough so that he lets go. He does more than that. He collapses off of me and lays on the floor, mouth opening and closing like a fish. I'm gasping the sounds he doesn't make as I struggle to breathe again alongside him. By the time I'm doing it normally, he's unconscious. There must have been something in the syringe. He was going to give me something before taking something, it seems. The first thing I do is pick the broken needle from the flesh of my hip. Thankfully, he didn't dose me. The second thing I do is take care of Hugo. I'm in the comms room when Hugo regains consciousness. I watch him on screen. He blinks a lot. His voice is slow. What are you doing? He asks the room. He knows I can see. He'd watched me the same way once, briefly. The answer should be obvious. I've put out gear in the elevator capsule with him, a backpack with a backup far more efficient than my prehistoric kinetic generator, and a bag of food and drink as well. Real food. I've also left him directions to Alf Alpha. They might help him. He doesn't like being ignored. He shouts the question again, bellowing it, his strength returning. What are you doing? I try to focus on what I'm doing. His tone is more resigned when he asks. I glance up from the wires I'm twisting together. I can see from the readout on screen. He's tried to cancel his descent. You can't come back up, I tell him, reaching for a solder strip. I lower it carefully to hold the wires in place, and it melds them to the comm board. Not yet, anyway. When I fix the comms you destroyed, the ones that go out station, then I'll call out to people including you, but starting with Mother. And Connor? I look at the screen. Hugo is looking at me as he speaks. He's, he's a good man. He's nodding, desperate for me to agree. A good doctor. What happened to the others wasn't his fault, it was mine. I made him come, and then I made him help clean up my mess. I don't know for sure what he's talking about but I have a good enough idea. It doesn't involve people taking a shuttle. Will you call him back? Please? Remembering the outgear Connor had left at 2-9, I doubt he'll come. He may love his brother enough to help him, even now, but the lack of rad guard he wears suggests he doesn't love himself much for doing it. Mother thought I hadn't told him about our outgear, that he left it because he didn't know. But the truth is, He knew what we had and where we kept it. I'm a tech mech. I get excited about things like that. I showed him when I gave him the grand tour. He simply chose not to take it. Still, I tell Hugo, yes, I'll call Connor. I'll call everyone I can. There's plenty of room up here. Plenty of everything. I just need to fix a few things. Then people will come. There's no limit to what we can do. Author's note. Announcer man? I thought you were dead. Hoped. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ray Cleely. I wrote Tethered to the Cold and Dying. I um, hope you enjoyed the story. This is the part where I tell you a little bit about its origins. Um, It began with the title, which isn't always the case with me, but this time I wanted to come up with something a bit more poetic and lyrical than my usual titles, which is where Tethered to the Cold and the Dying came from, Um, and then I just got rid of the second the, uh, so it was the Cold and Dying. 
after that I had to think about who or what was tethered to who or what um, and that's what got me the space elevator and the post-apocalyptic world um, with the post-apocalyptic world being the cold and dying um, tethered uh, to this space station up in space by a, a space elevator but I wanted a human element as well of course so that gave me the uh, opportunity to explore family ties and, and how we're tethered to people um, in our family whether we want to be or not so you've got the cold and dying also being the mother character and the Hugo character um, with Connor and Jackson tethered to them helping them whether they want to or not um, at first I didn't know what was wrong with Hugo because he was he was dying just like the mother character was dying um, but after a few pages of Jackson um, trekking towards the space elevator I realized I was rewriting Jack and the Beanstalk um, I must have known that at some level because I'd already called Jackson Jackson or Jack's son if you like haha uh -huh, very witty um, so after that it was a case of just boosting those fairy tale elements um, so I still didn't know what was wrong with Hugo but I knew that his cure was going to involve bones um, as in grinding the bones to make his bread kind of kind of thing from the fairy tale um, other ingredients were things like the exchanging of cow for beans um, or in this case the the slabs of meat for the the magic pills and the golden goose became actual geese uh, up in the space station each one of them sort of a, a potential roast dinner to someone like Jackson who's starving down there on on the real earth um, the biggest change to the original though was that I wanted Jackson to be a little bit more compassionate than Jack the giant killer as we know him um, so I kind of prepared the reader for that a little bit or the listener in this case um, by having that fishing flashback yeah, you know, he's, he's with his father and he, he throws the big fish back out into the world so that's kind of what he's doing to Hugo at the end there, he's just throwing him back out there into the world uh, which meant I could avoid the usual kind of doom and gloom dystopian sci-fi stuff um, although there is plenty of that dystopian element in the story um, and it also allowed me to have a, a slightly more hopeful ending um, speaking of which I hope you enjoyed hearing it uh, as much as I enjoyed writing it thank you If you've enjoyed it half as much no, no, that's as Ray Cluley oh. enjoyed writing it, then he's enjoyed it twice as much as you. <laughs> Good night. Of course, that's when the 16-ton weight falls on my head. Uh, yes, welcome back, folks. I hope you enjoyed our little jaunt into the cold and dying world. It wasn't little. That was okay. a long story. Gigantic jaunt. Haha, <laughs> very witty. Okay. Come on, giant, you know. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, I wanted to save this until later, but let me just get it out of the way right now. No, no, uh, I'm sorry, there isn't time. <laughs> um, we've got to get to the cast list, because after the story... Wait, wait, we didn't even list. tell people who produced this damn thing. That's right. <clears throat> we'll start with that. Today's, Today's story, story was produced, produced by Sunny, Sunny C. C. Bing! Wonderful job on that, by the way. This will be our Parsec submission, submission next year. But I'm going to make Sunny put together <laughs> the submission and send it in. Because obviously if I do it, it fails. He created an amazing soundscape. We listened to it in your car. And uh, there were times when I thought that there were sounds coming from outside the car. And, still, <laughs> you know, and then it was just actually the, the music and sound effects and, and uh, the in between music and sound effects which came every time that the the signal yeah, the came L, up the, the, yeah that thing was very cool choop, 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 choop. but yeah Sonny was our producer did an awesome job yeah, I mean yeah. he always does but this time wow yeah I think this is an early Parsec candidate for next year let's see what else do we have on our cast list Jackson Jack's son haha very witty stop it was, <laughs> was played by Rish Connor, Con, her, yeah, was played by Big. Mother was played by. It, it turns out I've been pronouncing her name wrong all along. It was played by Deja B. Rhymes with Indonesia. Oh, cool! Not whatever the heck I said before, which was totally wrong. And lastly, Hugo was played by Sunny C. The 
inimitable producer of today's story. Haha, <laughs> very witty, very witty. <laughs> Sun E. Oh. Okay, sorry. Okay, so now let me get it out of the way. Oh, okay. Get it out of the way now. It's it's get it out there. Put it out. <laughs> I've never been one to puff myself up on this show. And so here's another opportunity to mock me. I didn't realize that this was Jack and the Beanstalk until you mentioned it to me. <laughs> and I was like, what are you talking about, Jack and the Beanstalk? And then you're like, okay, so there's a giant and there was a tower and there were the beans and there was a cow. And, there was a... and I was like, really? I still don't see it. <laughs> and then even in the author's note, he mentions how, you know, subconsciously, and then more consciously, all over my head. Yeah, it was. In, I, I think I realized it when he pulled out the pills and he talked about them being bean, little beans in his hands or whatever, something like that. I don't remember exactly how it went, but I was like, oh, that's what this is. And this, this is the beanstalk that goes up to the, oh, and the giant lives up in the sky. Oh. <laughs> oh, that was interesting. Oh, it, it totally is. It's neat that it's all there. And I don't know, if, you, if you're a listener and you didn't pick up on it, let us know. And if you did pick on, up on it, you're very smart. Haha, uh -huh. smarter than me. Well, I, I've got something in here. Sonny actually forwarded this along. He said we didn't have to use it for the show. He made it for his own amusement, but I'm going to use it on the show anyways. This okay. is the uh, Tethered to the to Cold... Sorry. <clears throat> this is the Tethered to the Cold and Dying drinking game. Oh, okay. everyone get your glasses. Now, you have to take a sip every time a line of dialogue, when taken out of context, sounds vulgar or sexual. I think you noticed a few of these. Yes, For I did. For example, I wonder if she's sucking a tube of synth for her evening meal. <laughs> take a sip. Number two, take a sip every time a line of dialogue, even when left in context, sounds vulgar or sexual. <laughs> For example, my mouth floods with saliva at the thought of hot meat. <laughs> oh my gosh. You know what's really creepy is I saw that bumper sticker on your wife's car. Oh, okay, so I couldn't deliver it. It's just <laughs> Okay, number three. For every Jack and the Beanstalk reference, you get the first time you listen to the story. Like... Oh, here we go. He showed me a handful of pills. They were pale as beans and almost the same size. Take a sip. Oh, wait, you don't get a sip. Sorry, I put it back down. I sober. <laughs> oh, he's got more here. Let's see. Take two sips for every Jack and the Beanstalk reference you get the second time you listen to the story. For example, the man's name is Hugo and he wants my bone marrow. Reference to the giant's. Wanting to grind Jack's bones and eat them with bread. Took him multiple times to notice that one going through the story. Did he smell the blood of an Englishman? <laughs> Perhaps. Uh, number two for the double sip. Every time someone has to point out a Jack and the Beanstalk reference to you because you had listened to the story so many times, you were beginning to get cross-eyed. Well, you know, this is... Starting to sound like you have to be the producer of the show to actually uh, do that one. The example here is Jackson sends Hugo down with directions to Alf Alpha, a possible reference to Jack killing the giant and him falling into the farmer's field, which may have been planted with alfalfa sprouts. Yeah, that might be a little pushing it. Lastly, drink the entire beverage if and when you figure out the overly subtle audio Easter egg that is hidden in the musical transitions between scenes. Ooh. Mm. I, I, you know, I can't drink my whole drink yet. I'm going to have to listen to this again for the overly subtle Okay, hey, Easter somebody egg. post that in the forums when you discover it. The first person to post that in the forums will have, I don't know, a character named after them in a story, a forthcoming story oh, that cool. one of us write. Has that? Do they have to be named after the person's forum name or <laughs> their real name? <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, I don't know. I was just trying to come up with some uh, free gift. Yeah, there, that you, go, there you go. Out. That's a good way to go about it. Yeah, that would be cool uh, if somebody knows what it is. I'm going to have to listen to it again and see if I can figure it out now. You know, the funny thing is I remember both of us looking at each other and 
smirking and giggling in that kind of uncomfortable eighth grade way when we heard the line my mouth floods with saliva and the thought of hot, hot meat, meat. <laughs> that's good stuff oh I, I, can you post the drinking game rules in the show notes somewhere just like a link to them sure sure i can do that just for fun i'll put it in there that's what she said <laughs> Ooh, a, a line that could subtly be thought of. In a, uh, anyways, I don't know how much to say about the story. It seems like we've been talking a long time already, and the story was long. But but we I, do an episode once a year now, so we might as well let it be five hours I long. I know, and for Dr. Cluley, yeah, he, he hadn't even considered he's, going to medical school. He's going to he be your Frankenstein? <laughs> no, it's just when he... Uh, <laughs> Just, I was about to apologize because it's been so long. This was a story that was sent to us before we closed submissions. Yeah, it was one of the last ones that eked in under the uh, the door as it, it was slamming down. The Close road. the blast doors. Yeah. Close the bl- okay. Anyhow, uh, I, I do apologize about this. And it had Sonny not produced this story for us, it would still be waiting. Yeah, it'd still be languishing. So thanks, Sonny. And you did a kick-ass job. So thanks for that, too. But now that you have this fabulous workspace, do you think episodes will start coming faster and furiouser? I, I hope so. Uh, unfortunately, we still haven't finished getting our house unpacked and put together. It's been less than two weeks that we've been in this house now. And so each night I come home from work and put stuff together, get stuff unpacked, get stuff set up. And it's pretty much, that's all I do. I I go to work and I work and then I come home and I work and then I go to bed. And then I get up in the morning and I go to work and I come home and work. And so it's tough to get anything done. I haven't, I haven't even done like jogging or anything like that, that I normally do just because I I don't even go to bed until really late. And so I'm too tired to get up in the morning and do that. And I just, uh, I'm hoping that we'll get to that point soon. Well, this has been crazy. You and I got together once to record in the month of August. And we used that getting together to do an episode of Drabblecast. <laughs> but before that, it was July, the last time we recorded in this room. And uh, today you and I were going to get together and your car wouldn't start. Yep. Again. Yeah, it died so it's on just me. like the forces of, of density are trying to prevent us from uh, doing more shows of the Dunsteef. So who knows? Yeah, it, it all is kind of up in the air. I hope that I can start being able to concentrate more on those kind of things. I want to also concentrate more on writing and get writing out there. I'm, very recently, you put out your first story. You were It was the last episode that we aired, yeah, which was The Calling, that all of a sudden you're like, Shh, everybody said I should do this, and so now I will. And you put your story out there so people could buy it on the Kindle. And you found it to be such an, a simple thing that you're all about it. And you're like trying to do it every freaking five minutes. Well, until the until, until I the first negative it. comment comes along. I, you know, I haven't gotten any. <laughs> and it was so cool to hear people like that story. I mean, people really got into it and they had like questions and stuff. And what happens next and that and made me start thinking about like following it up with another story and things like that. And that's exactly the kind of reinforcement that I needed in the first place, I mean, it makes me wish that we had done that years ago mm-hmm. and I had started putting things out years ago. And we've been saying for years that if only we just put it out, we probably would wish we'd done it years ago. Yeah. And here I mean, we are years later after having said that already years ago. OK, now I'm, <laughs> the, the timelines are getting crossed. We're going to have to have Doc Brown draw us a diagram. Yeah, I, hopefully you will get some encouragement from that too or or if not encouragement the competitive nature where you're like i'm going to put one of my stories out there to, for for sale on not on audible on shit. audible it's available on our podcast if you want to listen to it okay <laughs> by the way the calling is available on amazon.com or uh in the is it the kindle store i'm not sure uh-huh. how those things work for purchase it's not very expensive i mean of course you've already listened to it but if you want to support me you want to read the new ending there it is Big and I have a broken mirror collection. Is it fair to say it's a collection? I was going to say a two pack or something it like collects that. Collects two stories a into Shakur. one. And yes, it is a collection uh, that we put out there called Pretty Ugly. It's about it's two stories that we wrote based on the same premise. Remember what the premise was? 
Well, the premise was just a average plain girl suddenly becomes beautiful. Go. And yeah, that's exactly what it was. <laughs> we both wrote those stories. And then when we discovered it, I think it was one of those where. Yeah, we didn't mean to. I mentioned this girl that I knew. It was on the show to you that I thought was suddenly beautiful. And I was like, well, how the hell did that happen? And, and I couldn't stop thinking about it. So I think I wrote three stories based on oh, wow. me trying to get my brain around it. It's like, well, what if this had happened? And what if? It, and then you wrote a story too. And it, and it was like, hey, let's do a collect. Let's do, let's put them together and see if people will buy it. And so that is available also on Amazon right now. And it is, like I said, called Pretty Ugly. Your story was called? The Mirror Sometimes Lies. And my story was called The Ugly Table. And the uh, beaten with the ugly stick. Ooh, that's not bad. <laughs> but we put them together. I wrote a little afterward where it explained what I just explained yeah, to you. What you've already heard. Um, so just skip that part when you get But to it's it. out there. <laughs> and if people want to buy it, they can. And if people do buy it, then we'll do it again. Yeah, we're, we're kind of uh, committed to try and do this thing. And uh, yeah, I think we've already... Which one did you decide was going to be our next Broken Mirror story collection? I, in, I think it was 2005 I sent you an email and I said, somebody stumbles across an item purporting to be a revenge crystal, but it turns out to work all too well. Go! Bum, bum, bum. And yes, you wrote a story about it and I wrote a story about it. And I haven't looked at that story since then. <laughs> but I said, that's going to be our next okay. Broken Mirror I better look collection. at mine, too, and make sure it's all the way up to snuff. I know that I had to rejigger the ending of that one like three times before mostly pleased with it. I still, I'm not sure if I'm 100% pleased. So I better read that one over real quick and make sure it's up to snuff. Yeah, and me too. I, I, I can't remember. It's been years. So. Where do you think that phrase comes from, up to snuff? Snuff is that stuff that they used to snort up their noses back in like the old days. It may be that that uh, that was tobacco, right? I or, or I, I don't really know, but I think so. But it may be that that stuff had to be ground exceedingly fine. Yeah, something to like be that. Snuff. It was like so only the purest was really best good. Had to be up to snuff. Yeah, I don't know. That's what I was wondering. Anyway, sorry. I know. Moving I back. I know somebody out there knows. So put that in the comments too, and Rich will name a character after you. Oh, in a broken mirrors. No, you're going to do it. All, all your characters are named after somebody. We're going to give away characters like it's going to be all over the place, like Rain. Okay, okay, that's fine. <laughs> Who wrote Rain? Like oh, that. Abby Mannheim. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, I, I'm sorry uh, that it's been so damn long, Ray Cluley, and I'm sorry that it's been so damn long, Sunny C, because he worked awful hard on this thing and then it just sat for a long, long, long time. But life kicked in the door and had its way with us yeah it really it did just... the summer's been a, a interesting summer we're going to talk about this whole summer thing over on our sister podcast that gets my goat am i right yeah i, th I think so i mean i had disasters and you had in impediments to, to reaching your goals problems and it's just like idiot things that, that you were telling me that, that the last minute after everything was signed or whatever they're like oh no it's gonna have to be another two weeks and you're just like what <laughs> because they had made a mistake right <laughs> anyhow i don't i know we don't mention that gets my goat a lot but it's out there over at dunesteef.blogspot.com and there's a you can get the feed you can get iTunes. onto it on itunes or any other podcatcher i think it's on stitcher and all those places that you can get feeds from you can throw it in there and just have it download to your uh, your machine automatically and to tell you the truth if you think we've never had any episodes for a long time go look over there because there's actually a fair amount that gets my goat is like rish's baby and he keeps it he feeds it often <laughs> my baby thing. my baby is on a, is danger of death but rish's baby lives because he takes care of it it's been so long since we've done an episode that I feel like this is kind of a uh, season premiere, you know, just like, <laughs> hey, for those of you who are just joining us, this is what our show is all about. But yeah, we're uh, available at www.doonsteef.com. <laughs> we, we welcome forum people come, coming over to doonsteef.freeforums.org. 
you can play games with us or well not yeah really we've, we've got One the game. uh yeah there's the the, the never-ending movie quotes game you can yeah. talk about your running adventures you can talk about anything really that you want to people are talking books and comics and they talk about the show on the odd occasion that we actually release one. But yes, you can go there and comment on this episode or comment on any episode that we've had previous. You and can even create a page for an episode. The one I always use for an example is Good Day by Saul Lemerant. <laughs> you can comment on that story there if you want to. I like the forums. I try to go to them every single day just to see if somebody has posted something new. Okay, so we've done housekeeping. You want fresh towel? You want mint for pillow? <laughs> what kind of a hotel is this? So, yeah, we've done that stuff, which we haven't done in a long time. But then we haven't done an episode in a long time, so maybe that's why it feels that way. The story was interesting. I don't know if you've heard a lot of other short stories that are like this, where or read. That's generally what people do with short stories. But those Not of me. us who listen to podcasts often hear short stories instead i don't know if you've heard or read any of them where they're like this where it's a fairy tale uh reimagined as a sci-fi story or just reimagined sometimes they take it and just change it around somewhat uh there's been several movies uh recently where they've done that with you had the snow white and the huntsman and what was the other Snow White one called? Mirror, Mirror. Uh, mirror, Mirror with Julia Roberts in it. Wasn't enough to save it. There um, was the uh, Red Riding Hood with Amanda Seyfried. Yeah. That you and I were going to see. We still haven't Never seen saw. it. There was uh, that Hansel and Gretel movie. Witch Hunters, yeah. <laughs> where they're freaking witch hunters. That's they, a, they did a Rapunzel movie. Uh, that's true. I don't think that was so much reimagined, really, though. They just kind of... I mean, I guess any Disney version of a fairy tale is kind of reimagined. Okay, so that's not a good example. But after all, the Little Mermaid is supposed to turn into sea foam at the end of the Hans Christian Andersen. Yes. <laughs> but she escapes that fate and gets to just be a benevolent spirit instead of a horrible poltergeist or something. But yeah, I don't know. <laughs> if Disney had gone with that ending, and you've watched like the making of where they show the storyboarded she turns into sea foam ending, right? I don't know that I have seen yeah. that. If they had done that, would we have had our Disney Renaissance? No. Beauty and the Beast would not have <laughs> ever been released, and they would have freaking fired everybody. <laughs> but yeah, I, you know, the funny thing is I remember watching that when I actually went to see it when I was a teenager and going, she was supposed to turn into the sea phone. What the heck? That's oh, a, really? That's, that's lame. My friend Jeff was that same way. should have like, totally done that. Christian Anderson killed her. Disney, you suck. <laughs> Boo. And everybody else was like, this is the most magical movie. I've I didn't ever. say that. I just, you know, kind of was jokingly saying, oh, yeah, she's supposed to turn into sea foam. That was totally, bleh, you know, as a joke. Um, but, yeah, I did know at the time and it actually came up. I'm just like, they're, they're going to turn her into sea foam. Oh. Why would you want? To <laughs> I didn't want to that. I'm just saying that's because I knew that was how the, the actual story went. But you knew they were going to happy endize it. They happy endized the fudge and hunchback of Notre Dame. <laughs> yeah, there you go. But have you read some stories that are like these? I, I, I've heard at least a few over on Escape Pod. I know, or their sister podcasts, um, whichever one it may have happened to have been on. I'm not sure. Pod cause... Grizzle. Yeah, there was one. There was one I remember from that was oh, a my pod, pod. Damn it! <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Yeah. There was one that was a, a Emperor's New Clothes. It was a sci-fi story. Version. No, it wasn't sci-fi. It was still. It was just like a reimagining, or a, here's how it probably really happened, and then it was turned into this fairy tale from that kind of a thing. But yeah, the dude was buck naked. That's all that matters. Yeah, ma. I'm buck naked. I remember there was a part near the end where he was talking about it was something like there was some big ball and he was going to it and he went naked and then he realized that somehow it is the plan that he had failed and he had to dance around naked in this ball the whole time and his manhood was flopping about as he danced. Some I remember that line very thinking, oh of course you descriptive. Uh, th there have been a few others. I remember there being a 
Princess and the P one on I want to say it was an escape pod miniature. What the hell is that? Oh, when they do when a they flash do a flasher, yeah. Oh, I thought we were never going to mention escape pod again. Oh, oh no, that's Man of Steel. <laughs> it seems like that's kind of a trend recently. Well, it seems like it would be a fun exercise to do in a writing class or just as writers. Mm -hmm. Just to say, you know, let me come up with a sci-fi version of Little Red Riding Hood or, or, you know. Yeah, that's kind of fun. I'm always thinking of sci-fi versions of like a Western or a sci-fi version of an 80s sex romp. (laughs) That's cool. Like, like Revenge of the Nerds, but with aliens. <laughs> yeah, there you go. That's what I'm talking about. I like it. Like Revenge of the Nerds, but with monsters that live in your closet. Something like that, you know? Oh, <laughs> I see. I didn't realize where you were going with that. Sometimes I wonder, though, the idea of that. If you do it with a fairy tale, it seems like people consider that to be legit. But if you just take a movie plot and use that but do it as a sci-fi film or something like that, or sorry, a sci-fi story, then it seems like people will think you're a hack that just steals stories from somebody else. Mm. Or do people just want to say somebody's a hack if they didn't like what they did or didn't appreciate it? It's possible that uh, it just depends on how the finished product comes out. A good example is there was a series of dragon books that were the Star Wars trilogy. And I didn't think they were well done, so that guy was a hack. But I know other people, there's like, oh, that's so brilliant. You know what? That second book is kind of like The Empire Strikes Back. Yeah, well, I guess it is. <clears throat> but taking something that's established and then changing the genre or changing the setting, taking Seven Samurai and turning it into a Western, or taking... Seven Samurai and turning it into a movie about ants and grasshoppers? Exactly. That kind of thing tends to really light up people's imagination. And they're all the more impressed if they didn't realize that Bug's Life was the Magnificent Seven or that Lion King was Hamlet or something like that. We're just like, wow, that's great. They, 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 they took a classic story and they made it into something else. So I, I really think it's just the end product. If it's badly done, maybe they didn't succeed. But like that... Little Red Riding Hood that we mentioned with Amanda Seyfried. Apparently, instead of a big bad wolf, it was a werewolf. And I thought, what a brilliant idea. That's so cool. But not having seen it, maybe it was badly done. I don't know. Maybe you're just like, oh, what a hack. I, yeah, I, I don't know. We didn't see <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, see, it's funny. I've had a lot of ideas like that where I thought, oh, this would be really cool to take this story and make it into a sci-fi story instead of a Western or a 80s sex romp. <laughs> I don't, I don't, but I'm always afraid to proceed from there because I just assume people will be like, oh, you just stole this from whatever. And you hear that a lot. I mean, I know that you are somebody who's really sensitive to that too. Like if yeah. you have an idea and somebody says, oh, this idea, even if they're being very complimentary, if they happen to mention that your idea is similar to something else, you're just like, oh. You know, it was nice that they had a nice comment for me, but I wish they wouldn't have mentioned that other story that it was similar to. Yeah, it really, really bothers me. And it's something that I don't know that I'll ever get over. And sometimes you're just, you are afraid to even mention a a story because you're afraid someone might say, oh, this is like this. And, And you'll tell me even a story and be like, and if you say that it's like this. If you say that it's bachelor party, but on a space station, I will. Yeah. Sorry, that sounds like a pretty good idea. If you say it's weird science, but uh, set in the medieval times. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's hard to get past that. I, there's several ideas where I thought, oh, I'm just going to totally do this. And this person is going to be this. And this person is going to be this. But then I'm afraid to ever go forward with it because I'm sure that somebody will recognize it. And once they recognize it, it's like, oh, this guy's a hack. He just stole his story idea from here. But maybe that's not true. I mean, this uh, obviously... With this story, we didn't think that. As soon as we realized, oh, gosh, this is Jack. Oh, that's so cool. See, I, and this is yeah, this I and that is that. More. And now I've got to drink a sip here. And Seagull. <laughs> yeah, when you pointed it out to me, it was like, oh, shoot, I need to go back and, and read it again. Because I could appreciate it on a whole new level. Plus get very, very drunk. Thanks, yes, son. there you go. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know. I, I Because 
I'm so, uh, what's the word? Burn. Oh my gosh, did you hear what he did? See, that That was really obscure-ish. Uh, because I'm unconfident, I know that's not a word, in my writing, you know, I, I, I guess I would be afraid of that. But just to do it, to see how it could come out, I mean, to, to take break into electric boogaloo <laughs> and set it in the third circle of hell that, that has and, the potential of being something really really interesting but yeah. if you have that fear of uh you know somebody saying that you're a hack because it's from something else then yet that's one more obstacle in writing that gets in the way of you of your writing and it's just, it sucks that there's already so many obstacles but it's just if we were in uh, perpetually in a creative writing class and we always had to write stuff all the time we would do this kind of thing all the time where we just come up with any excuse to write something that we wouldn't have already written it's like those uh, masters of the macabre contests <laughs> that i always enter and always lose but i don't mind losing them i i want to keep losing so i can keep entering the contest yeah um and and writing stories that it, whether they suck or not i would never ever write without those prompts Speaking of that, we've just recently finally finished grading, or whatever you would call it, all of those uh, triple word score stories. The triple word scores are scored. Um, so yeah, we, that's one thing you can look forward to. There was, I want to say like 14 stories that scored higher than a 7.0. Whoa, how? There was an average... Everybody gave it a score, and then they averaged them out. And so I don't know if we're going to do all of those or not, but I'm betting that we may well do that because they're short, and we can get them done quick, and we can put out episodes more often than once a freaking year. Oh, that would be cool. Uh, yeah, it was me that you were all waiting for. We would have had these done for once well, instead I, of me. I didn't say that. But uh, I, I sent Nicole my last review and said I, this is it I've, I've done them all and she said well no i still haven't gotten the review of so-and-so story and i was like i remember reading that I, I know i reviewed it and so i went and sure enough there was the review and it's like i like this i like this about the story i didn't like this and i was like well how does nicole and i looked and i had responded to the author of the story <laughs> nice <sighs> Because but I forwarded it on to uh, Nicole, and then I, we were all done. And she tallied up all the scores, and you looked at them. I didn't, so. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I just looked at them today. I, I oh. tried to get it on, and it wouldn't let me because the email that it was sent to was not the email that was the email that was used for my particular account and see blah, blah, blah. It was one of those kind of things. But I finally did get to see them, and I saw that there was a lot that were scored highly, and uh, yeah, I'm I'm pretty excited about what we'll be able to do with these and uh, thankful to everybody who participated in the contest. And yeah, that was one of the cool things you, do, you were just talking about, the Masters of the Macabre contest and how by doing that, you wrote stories that you would never have written before. And this story that I wrote for this show or this contest, I know that I would never, ever, ever have written this story otherwise. And it's the only story. You yeah, it's one of the only stories. That I think I wrote a couple early on this year. I was all into my goals and all that kind of stuff, and I wrote a story or two. But yeah, I'd gone like months without doing one, and then I had to do this one. And, and it was it was fun to write. It was interesting to do. It was totally different than anything that I would have done otherwise. And I just because I was trying to do something different, you know, I took those things and I thought, okay... These words could easily be used for this, but let's see if I can think of another way to use them. And yeah, so I went, uh, I came up with a story and it has a bad title, unfortunately, because like I've said, I think before in the show, I can either get a good title for a story right away, often usually before I even start writing it, or I just never get a title for it. And I just have to pull some piece of crap out of my butt Ew. and slap it on the page and call it the title. Well, Ray said something like that in its author's note about that he came up with a title first and then, I'm assuming, had to come up with a story that fit tethered to the cold and dying. Uh, and he failed at that. 
Um, but yeah, I, I, I really enjoyed writing that story that uh, I did. And so I think that contest turned out to be a good contest. It may be a while before we get around to doing that contest again, but I think we will do this contest again, considering that we have at least probably like 14 stories from the contest to put on the air. It may take us a while to get through those. Hopefully it will be faster. We have had people volunteer this week even to edit to produce. and produce the stories. Oh, okay. And if, yeah, if you're out there and you'd like to produce their short stories, yeah. 2,000 words or less. 2,000 so, words or less. So it won't be an undertaking like Sonny did here with uh, yeah. Teethered. You will not get a 50-minute story <laughs> to edit. But it would be nice if we racked up a bunch of those all ready to go. And it didn't have to always be a Rish Outfield and Big Anklevich story, which was your goal for Dune Steve 2.0. <laughs> Part of that was there would be other stories here and there in between. So that'll give us a lot of chance for that. So, uh, yeah, if you're interested in producing, let us know. And uh, we'll see if we can start getting those on the air. We still need to talk about it and decide how many of them we are going to do which ones we're going to do there's going to be a lot i think but that's good news it, it is and i'm excited about it because if if there was one story that we liked then i think that probably would make this the contest a failure yeah but there was a so many people that entered it which made it awesome and b when i was reading those sorry i, I, I do that so wrong i don't do it cool like you a there was so many stories two when I was reading those stories, it took me a while to find one that I didn't like, which was really amazing to me. I read like seven or eight or nine or something like that before I found the first one. I was like, oh, this one I could probably pass on. But yeah, I just kept going, wow, this one's good too. Oh, this one's good too. And to the point where I was just like, dude, we're, we're going to wind up doing all of these stories. And then you got to mine. Yeah. I made sure to... Uh, plan ahead for that one so i could give that a really low score you're a spiteful evil bastard. yes yes i am uh, <laughs> uh let people know how they can volunteer to produce an episode okay just send us an email at editor at doonstief.com and just tell us hey i want to produce we've got a few people just this week and all the way back when we first you know, started this contest, there were several people that also sent us emails saying that they volunteered to help with that. So we're going to go through and A, decide all the stories that we're going to use and two, okay, you're getting better. assign the people to those stories here shortly. But I yeah. think I should probably volunteer for one and you should probably volunteer for oh, one. Oh, but yeah, I, I, about that. <laughs> you know, no one could leave those to last. <laughs> no, we, we should just Sure. I, I'll grab one and try and say, okay. Yeah. I'd be willing to bet that you and I can even do more than one. I think you overestimate my <laughs> chances. <laughs> so so this is the end of our episode then? Yeah, I think or, we need to bring it to an end. Unfortunately, no, it's getting... Doing Steve the next generation. Yes, it's getting very late. One last thing. We don't ask for this very often, but if you'd like to donate to the show, there is a way to do that. Unfortunately, I can no longer remember what that way is. You press the button. Oh, okay. They're, they're what is on the page? That's right. On our, do, on our site, thedunesteef.com, there are several options even. You can donate a one-time donation where you just go in there, you say how much you want to donate, and it comes to us. Or you can set up a subscription where you donate five bucks a month or five bucks a quarter if five bucks a month is a little too steep for you. So yeah, you can pick any of those and we appreciate all of them. And here shortly, we will have our new incentive episode will be ready. That's right. And uh, it, it should be, it, it's coming close. I finally got around to giving our producer on that story some notes. Oh, good, good. And he should have it put together soon, and then we'll be able to send it out to the people who donate. And uh, you can get to see what a story that gets a one <laughs> sounds like. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, in the interim, since we stopped podcasting, I created my own podcast. Well, I mean, you made me do it. but He made me! 
I decided to have an episode that would be an incentive episode. And I'm about a third of the way through editing it. So that too would go to somebody that would, what is it, subscribe to the show? Is that what? I think just a donation, a one timer is even good. You don't necessarily have to subscribe. But yes, if you want to subscribe to the show, we'll have Biggs' award winning Broken Mirror <laughs> contest entry. And uh, you can have an episode of the Rish Outcast, as you called it. There you go. All right. Thanks for listening, folks. Hope you enjoyed the show, and uh, we'll see you again soon, hopefully. Soon. And for the rest of your life. This uh, looks like the start of a beautiful but I couldn't do it. It's too, All right. too stupid even for me, sir. <laughs> and that really is saying something. Oh, an answer man! Oh, an answer man, everybody. He is here. Holy, we forgot. <laughs> thank you, announcer man, for coming back and thank you listeners for coming back yeah his, his poor little booth in in the new studio is a little smaller than it was in the kitchen hopefully you can fit in and out of that door we'll have to see all right thanks for listening everybody we'll see you later the dune steve audio fiction magazine is published under a creative commons attribution non-commercial no derivatives license this means that you can share the Dune Steef with anyone you'd like, but you can't sell or change the files. Scarecrow, I think I'll miss you most of all. Take two. Do you remember I was going to write a sketch about the devil coming to you? Because we had done one where the devil came to me, right? Right. And he offers to trade you for a Parsec Award. And I can't remember what, what it was uh, that he, he was going to ultimately demand. And you're like, uh, no, I can't do it. And he's like, oh, you were so close kind of thing. We never did any of that. It's just because we stopped doing episodes. <laughs> but Anyway, I would that, have that been was so great to be able to sing a Fiddler on the Roof song, though. It's too bad I didn't get my chance. Oh my gosh, I did that too. <laughs> how many song? How many was... Parsec songs have I done? <laughs> yeah, that was the devil uh, you from last time. Parsec. Do, 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 do. Uh, oh, save that up just for you. Gross. Welcome to the show.